Hi there, my name is Haney Kutab, and I'm one of the ultrasound faculty members in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Today I'm going to talk with you all about the RUSH exam, something that you may or may not see done during your rotation in the emergency department with us these next few weeks. After this lecture, you'll be getting some hands-on scanning time with one of our awesome EM faculty to put these skills to the test. A plug for our ultrasound page, please visit our website at madtownsano.com. This is our hub for all things ultrasound-based for our department. This lecture, along with many of the other lectures, will be live on this website. Check it out if you're interested in learning more about ultrasound. We'll start with a case. An 84-year-old male presents to the ED with complaints of chest pain, dizziness, and feeling unwell. The history is limited secondary to the patient's altered mental status. He has a history of heart failure, blood clots, and COPD. His vital signs are as followed, a blood pressure of 60 over 40, a heart rate of 140, an oxygen saturation of 86%, which improves to 93% on a non-rebreather. What are the next steps for this patient? Is this somebody that you would send to the CT scanner, work them up for possible pulmonary embolism? No, absolutely not. This is not somebody who we would want to whisk away to CT scan. His vital signs are just too unstable and he should remain in the resuscitation room. Instead, we will use ultrasound at the patient's bedside while treatment are ongoing to help us determine what the cause of hypotension is. We will use something called the RUSH exam, which stands for the Rapid Ultrasound for Shock and Hypotension. The goal of this protocol is to combine the key elements from various ultrasound views that we usually easily obtain in the ED to help us answer the question, what's causing this patient to be hypotensive? And when we know the cause, then we will be able to treat it. Most of the views required in a rush exam are views that are already used in other ultrasound studies and that are pretty easy to learn. A good mnemonic to remember the views is HIMAP, H-I-M-A-P. We will cover each of these soon, but HIMAP stands for heart, IVC, Morrison's pouch, aorta, and pulmonary. One quick note, it's always important to take into account the clinical history of the patient and interpret your ultrasound findings in light of this context. For example, if somebody has heart failure and arrives with dyspnea and hypotension, I may deprioritize looking at the aorta or Morrison's pouch and spend more time focusing on the heart, lungs, and IVC. So we'll start with the H of HIMAP, the heart. For this exam, I use the cardiac or phased array probe. The views I obtain are either the parasternal views, where the probe is along the sternum of the chest with the indicator aiming towards the patient's right shoulder, or the apical four-chamber view, which we obtain lateral to the left nipple, aiming upwards at the heart in this direction, with the probe indicator pointing towards the patient's left elbow. The goals of this exam are threefold. First, you want to evaluate the left ventricular function and determine if there's heart failure or not. Next, you want to look at the right ventricle and find out if the right ventricle is enlarged or not. If it's enlarged and the patient is hypotensive, this could indicate a massive pulmonary embolism. Last, you want to look for pericardial effusions. Is there one present or not? And if there is, does the patient have cardiac tamponade that's causing them to be hypotensive? Here is what the normal views look like, both the parasternal long and the apical four chamber view. Let's cover some basic anatomy. On the parasternal long view, the very first thing that you're going to hit is the skin and soft tissue here. Right beneath that is the patient's right ventricle, which normally should look triangular and like a slice of pizza. Next to the right ventricle, you'll have the interventricular septum here, and beneath that you'll have the left ventricle, which is this large cavity and large chamber right here. Next to the right ventricle, you'll have the ascending aorta right here, and just beneath that you'll have the left atrium here. And then last, the most posterior structure, which you see all the way posterior to the left ventricle here, is the descending aorta. On the apical four-chamber view, you see the four chambers of the heart. This chamber here is the left ventricle. This chamber here is the left atrium with the mitral valve in between. This chamber here is the right ventricle. And this chamber here is the right atrium. How I know that this is the right side of the heart is a couple of different things. One, there's usually a fibrous band that sits in the apex of the right ventricle called the moderator band. Next, the tricuspid valve, which you see right here, always will sit closer to the apex of the heart than the mitral valve. So that's how I know this is the right side of the heart and this is the left side of the heart. It's important to know that because you should not use the size of the chambers because in cases of massive pulmonary embolism, the right ventricle will start to enlarge and will start to become the same size as the left ventricle. So you should not use the size alone in helping you determine left versus right. So first, we're going to cover left ventricular function. 
breaking this down into broad categories, you want to think about if the left ventricular function is normal or it's reduced. Pay attention to the actual cavity of the left ventricle. The size of this cavity should decrease by about 50% every time the heart beats. That would be a normal ejection fraction. You could also look at the mitral valve, which sits right here. And in a normal, happy, healthy heart, the mitral valve should slap or it should high five the interventricular septum here. Here's an example of a patient with severe heart failure. To recap, this up here is the right ventricle. This is the patient's left ventricle. Here is the patient's left atrium. This is the ascending aorta. And down here is the descending aorta here. But one is the chamber size here is hardly reducing. And two, look at that tip of the mitral valve. It's hardly coming anywhere near the interventricular septum. So this is an example of a patient with severely reduced heart failure. Here is what left ventricular failure looks like on the apical four chamber view. Again, in a normal heart, pay attention to the actual walls of the left ventricle and the cavity size of the left ventricle here. It should decrease by about 50 to 60%. In this same patient with severe heart failure, you notice that the chamber size is hardly decreasing. So this is an example of really severe left ventricular failure. Next, we'll talk about the right ventricle. So just to recap, here is that normal peristernal long view. At the top of the screen, you have the right ventricle, which sits right here. Normally, the right ventricle should be nice and triangular in shape. There's also a good rule called the rule of threes, that the right ventricle, the ascending aorta, and the left atrium should all be about one-third the size of the screen. One-third, one-third, one-third. As the RV begins to dilate, it starts to look much more circular in shape, almost like a pie. And if you see RV dilation in the setting of hypotension, this could mean that the patient has a massive pulmonary embolism. I like the apical four-chamber view when evaluating for right ventricular dysfunction. Here is that normal apical four-chamber view with this being the left side of the heart and this being the right side of the heart. Pay attention to the size of the right ventricle. It should be about one-third right ventricle to two-thirds left ventricle here. You can also place your eye on the tricuspid annulus, which sits right here. And you want to see this bouncing in and out. That would indicate normal right ventricular function. Here is a patient with right ventricular enlargement and RV failure secondary to a massive pulmonary embolism. Again, look at the size of the right ventricle and compare it to the left ventricle here. A normal right ventricle should be one-thirds to two-thirds right ventricle to left ventricle. But here, you see that the right ventricle is actually larger than the left ventricle here. Pay attention to that tricuspid annulus. It should be bouncing in and out like this, as you see on the normal here. And this guy is barely moving in and out. So if I were to see this in a patient who was hypotensive, I would think massive pulmonary embolism until proven otherwise. The last goal is to look for pericardial effusions. So here is that normal parasternal long view again. You want to look around the right ventricle and posterior to the left ventricle here, looking for any black, which could indicate a pericardial effusion. It should normally go anterior to the RV and then posterior to the LV here and cross in front of the descending aorta because the descending aorta is not contained within the pericardial sac. Here is an example of a patient with a pericardial effusion. So again, here's the patient's right ventricle, here's their left ventricle, and here's their descending aorta. But now you notice this thin black stripe of fluid anterior to the right ventricle here that tracks posterior to the left ventricle here and in front of the descending aorta. So that is what a pericardial effusion looks like. When you see a pericardial effusion, you also want to ask yourself the question, could the patient have pericardial tamponade? You want to then see and look if it's causing any collapse of the right ventricle. But in this case, the patient has a pericardial effusion without evidence of pericardial tamponade. Here is an example of what a pericardial effusion would look like in the apical four-chamber view. So again, here's the right side of the heart, and here's the left side of the heart but you see fluid both outside of the left ventricular wall here and in front of the right ventricular wall all right here. This is also an example of a patient with signs of tamponade. You'll see that the right ventricle looks like it's collapsing inwards as the heart beats, 
And more impressively, you see collapse of the right atrium as the heart is beating here, which is an early finding of pericardial tamponade. The eye of HIMAP is looking at the IVC, the inferior vena cava. This is a large blood vessel that dumps back into the heart. For this exam, I usually stick with the cardiac probe, but you can use the abdominal probe as well. You want to place the probe in the middle of the abdomen, in the epigastric or subxiphoid area, with the indicator either pointing towards the patient's head or the patient's feet. And you want to really rock your probe and look upwards at the heart and look at that IVC dumping into the right atrium of the heart. You want to pay attention to the size of the IVC, and it's really helpful at the extremes. Is the IVC fat or is it flat? Here is what a normal IVC looks like. So you see the patient's liver here. You see the right atrium of the heart here. You see this big black blood vessel here that's dumping directly into the right atrium of the heart. That is the IVC. It is normal to have the IVC collapse with some degree of respiratory variation. When the patient takes a deep breath in, their intrathoracic pressure will decrease, and that, as a result, will cause the IVC to collapse in some degree. Where you want to look is just distal to the point where the IVC and the hepatic veins meet. So right around this point here is where you want your eye to be. So as this patient is breathing, you do see some degree of collapse of the IVC here. If you see a fat IVC or a non-collapsible IVC, that either means that the tank is full or that something is causing the tank to be backed up. So when I see a fat IVC, I think about pulmonary embolism, heart failure with volume overload, or something like pericardial tamponade. If I see a flat IVC, that means the tank is empty. So I'm either thinking about a patient with severe sepsis or a patient with hypovolemia from either dehydration or blood loss. Here is that example of the normal IVC again. Again, big blood vessel dumping right into the right atrium of the heart. My eye is looking just distal to the point where the hepatic veins dump right into the IVC here. And here's an example of a flat IVC. You see that as the patient is breathing, the walls of the IVC come to a near complete collapse. So if I were to see this, it means that the patient's tank is empty and that they may need fluid or blood products to support their blood pressures. So here is an example of a fat IVC. You see a few different things here. One is the actual diameter of the IVC is rather large compared to the normal example here. But two, as the patient is breathing, you're seeing very minimal collapse of the IVC. So if I were to see a fat IVC, that could mean that there's something causing the tank to be backed up, a massive PE, cardiac tamponade, or that the tank is full, such as heart failure and a heart failure exacerbation. The M of HIMAP is Morrison's. So this is a part of the FAST exam. The FAST stands for the Focused Assessment with Sonography and Trauma. For this exam, you can either use the cardiac probe, but I usually will switch to the abdominal or the curvilinear probe here. The view that you want to obtain is the first view of the FAST exam, which is the right upper quadrant view, looking in Morrison's pouch. That's the space between the patient's liver and the patient's kidney on the right side. We're only looking in this area because it's the most sensitive area for free fluid in the abdomen. The FAST exam is not just for trauma anymore. It can really help you detect medical etiologies of intraperitoneal hemorrhage, like a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, a ruptured aneurysm, bleeding hepatic tumors, etc. The question that you want to answer here is, is there free fluid present in the abdomen? So here is what a normal Morrison's pouch will look like. So the indicator is aiming up towards the patient's head, located in the right mid-axillary line. You want to identify the patient's liver, which you see here, and the patient's right kidney, which you see here. You want to fan through that entire kidney from start to finish, paying attention to a few different spots. One is the tip of the liver right here. This is the most sensitive area in the whole FAST exam and where free fluid is most likely to start to accumulate. But also, you want to look all in between Morrison's pouch, which is the space in between the liver and the kidney here, and look for any evidence of black fluid between those two structures. So here is that normal Morrison's pouch view, and here is an example of a patient with a lot of intra-abdominal free fluid here. So here's the patient's liver on this side of the screen. Here's the tip of the liver here. 
here's the patient's right kidney and this black anechoic fluid that sits in between the liver and the kidney in Morrison's pouch indicates free fluid. And here's an example of a more subtle case and why it's important to pay attention to the tip of the liver. So you see liver at the top of the screen here, you see kidney down here, and if you're only looking at Morrison's pouch right here in between the kidney and the liver, you would miss the free fluid. But looking at and paying attention to the tip of the liver here, you do see this black stripe of fluid, which sits right at the tip of the liver. That is free fluid there. So once you've identified free fluid, you have to then ask yourself, what could that be? If it's a small amount of free fluid and it's a pediatric or a female patient, that could be physiologic or normal free fluid. If the patient has a large volume of free fluid and they have a history of heart failure, cirrhosis, or ESRD, that could just be simple ascites. Or if you identify free fluid on ultrasound and the patient is hypotensive and was recently in an accident or is at risk for being pregnant, that could also indicate intra-abdominal hemorrhage. Fluid all looks the same on ultrasound. It'll be anechoic in color, and there's no way to really tell whether the fluid is ascites or if it's hemorrhage. So you do have to put it into the right clinical context. The A in HIMAP stands for aorta. You should consider aortic pathology in patients with undifferentiated shock. I stick with the abdominal probe for this exam, and now you want to place the probe in the middle of the abdomen here with the indicator aiming towards the patient's right side. Think about a triple A in a patient with abdominal pain, elderly patients, and you want to look at three different spots, the proximal aorta, the mid aorta, and the distal aorta. One quick note about this exam, bowel gas is the enemy of aortic scans. Press and hold a downward pressure. That would help to displace some of the bowel gas and make the aorta much more easy to see. Here is what a normal aorta looks like. So I have the proximal aorta here, the mid aorta here, and the distal aorta here. These are all in the short axis view with the indicator aiming towards the patient's right side. We measured the aorta from top to bottom, anterior to posterior. The aorta, as you go down on the body, is actually going to become more superficial to the skin, and it should normally become narrower in size. The question that you want to ask yourself, again, is, is there evidence of a AAA? And is that AAA leaking, or has it ruptured? And is that what's causing the patient to be hypotensive? Remember that most AAAs actually live in the mid-aorta, or beneath the renal arteries, as you see here. The number that we care about is three centimeters. Anything that measures less than three centimeters is normal. Anything greater than three centimeters is abnormal. The larger the aorta, the more likely it is to have ruptured or is leaking. The way I remember this is that there are three A's in AAA, so less than three centimeters would be considered normal. Here is that normal aorta, which you see here in the short axis view, measured from anterior to posterior. And here is a case of a patient with a very large AAA, but also with a dissection crossing the middle of this aorta. When we measure anterior to posterior here, you see that it measures at 6.42 centimeters, which is abnormal and quite large. Here is a video clip of that same AAA with a dissection. What you actually see posterior to the aorta here, this bright white line, with this hypoechoic shadow is the spinal cord. This is a spinal vertebrae here, and the aorta will sit right on top of that spinal vertebrae there. Remember, normally it should measure less than three centimeters. This is much larger, and you see this thick cord sitting in the middle of the aorta, which is indicative of a dissection flap. Moving on to the last step of the rush exam and the P of HIMAP, the pulmonary assessment. For this exam, I usually stick with the abdominal probe, but honestly, you can use any of the probes for this exam, including the linear or the cardiac probe. You want to place the probe on the anterior chest in about the third or fourth intercostal space with the indicator aiming up towards the patient's head. The main question here is, does the patient have a pneumothorax? And if they do, and the patient is hypotensive, that would make me think about something like a tension pneumothorax. Here is an example of a normal lung. So in a normal lung, what you'll see is first the skin and soft tissue here. You'll see this pleural line, which is ind indicated by this white line that sits just beneath 
this intercostal muscle here. And you'll see lung sliding. As the patient is spontaneously breathing, the visceral and the parietal pleura on the lung will slide against one another. Here's another example. What you're seeing here is on this side, you have a patient rib, you have a patient rib over here, skin and soft tissue here, and then this white line all the way at the top of the screen, that is the pleural line. So I'm holding the probe really still, and I'm very carefully watching for lung sliding as the visceral and parietal pleura slide over one another. We can use the tool that we have available on the machine known as M-Mode, which drops a line down the middle of the screen, and it'll plot for you what is happening in this line over a period of time. It'll put it onto a graph, and it'll look something like this. So in a normal, healthy lung, what you're seeing here is skin and soft tissue, which is not moving. This white line here is the pleural line. And as the patient is breathing, you're seeing the visceral and the parietal pleura slide over one another. We call this the sandy beach sign. It's meant to represent the sand on a beach with the skin and soft tissue representing the waves of the beach. This is indicative of a normal lung and no pneumothorax present. Contrary to that, here's an example of a patient with a pneumothorax. So again, you're going to first hit the skin and the soft tissue here. You'll see the patient's rib on each side of your screen, and here is the pleural line. And if you watch closely, the patient is breathing. You see the skin and the soft tissue and the intercostal muscles moving, but you're not seeing any evidence of lung sliding here. When we drop that M-mode line through what we think is that pneumothorax, and we plot it over time, now, instead of seeing that sandy beach sign, now you're seeing just straight lines go all the way across where that sand is supposed to be. We call that the barcode sign. The way I remember this is barcodes are bad. You have to pay for things. And should you see the barcode sign and no lung sliding, that would mean that the patient likely has a pneumothorax. You can check multiple different spots of the lung. Sometimes I like to look more lateral or in the axillary area and scan downwards and look for something called the lung point. So this is the most specific finding for a pneumothorax. And what you're actually seeing here is the patient's lung is sliding here and then the patient's lung is not sliding here. So this is the exact point at which the pneumothorax exists. And this is the most specific finding for a pneumothorax. So that's HIMAP. Some have even gone as far as to expand the exam, which includes evaluation for ectopic pregnancy and for DVT, or blood clots in the leg. But we'll cover that another time. So just to summarize, here's that same patient that we had at the start of this lecture, hypotensive, tachycardic, with low oxygen saturations. This is a case that we would use ultrasound and the RUSH exam to help us evaluate this critically ill patient at the bedside and give us more information and insight into what's causing them to be in shock. Remember HIMAP, the heart, IVC, Morrison's, aorta, and pulmonary assessment. And it's okay to tailor your exam into the right clinical context. With the heart exam, remember to pay attention to the left ventricle. Is it squeezing normally, or does the patient have severe heart failure? Pay attention to the right ventricle. Is it nice and triangular in shape, or is it enlarged and now starting to look more circular? And remember the rule of threes, one-third RV, one-third ascending aorta, and one-third left atrium. Last, pay attention and look for pericardial effusions with signs of possible cardial tamponade. Remember the IVC, and what we really care about is, is the IVC fat? Is the tank full or backed up? Or is the IVC flat? Is the tank empty? Remember to look at Morrison's pouch, that spot between the patient's liver and the right kidney, and pay special attention to the inferior tip of the liver, looking for free fluid. Look at the aorta and look for evidence of a possible triple A, three A's in triple A, so less than three centimeters would be normal. And last, do a pulmonary assessment and pay attention to that visceral and parietal pleura sliding over one another. Again, visit our website at madtownsano.com for more lectures like this. And special thanks to the POCUS Atlas, specifically their shock section, which helped to provide some of the images used in this lecture. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me or follow me on Twitter. Thanks. I hope to scan with you guys soon sometime in the ED.